50 to 85% of Americans actually don't get the recommended daily amount of magnesium. And this could contribute to magnesium deficiency in the long term, which could then contribute to heart disease, high blood pressure, and inflammation. There's been a lot of very suggestive studies. For example, this 2012 meta-analysis suggested that there is a close correlation between low magnesium level intake and heart disease. So what is magnesium? Magnesium is one of the trace minerals. It's called the micronutrients because the amount is very small. And these include things such as calcium, as well as selenium, iron, and also the vitamins like A, B, C, D, and so on. Mostly people with low magnesium tend to be a little hyper excitable, particularly with the nerves. So they might have, for example, uh, constipation, they may have sort of cramping, they may have these sort of myoclonic jerks that happen, as well as more nonspecific symptoms such as uh, tiredness and so on. Magnesium is found mostly in plant foods uh, as well as seafood. Seafood is because in the salt water there may be magnesium and accumulates in the bodies of uh, the fish and the shellfish and the plants because if they're grown in soil with magnesium they're going to have the magnesium. In the body the ma most magnesium is stored in the bones, about 60%, but also 20% in the muscles, skeletal muscles, as well as the organs, which explains why a lot of times you get these symptoms of muscle cramping and so on. Very little of the magnesium is actually stored in the blood, and that's why when you measure blood levels of magnesium, it doesn't always tell you if your body has too little magnesium. So why is magnesium deficiency so common these days? And probably one of the most important reasons is the declining magnesium in our crops. You have to understand that when you grow crops in natural uh, soil, in the past, what would happen is that these crops would grow and then they would decompose and all the nutrients would go back into the soil. With the advent of the Green Revolution and sort of industrial scale farming, we came to rely more and more on chemical fertilizers. So instead of putting manure on our fields, we would put chemical fertilizers. And these are predominantly three things, the so-called NPK, N for nitrogen, P for phosphorus, and K for potassium. And we would put these because they could be made from uh, potash or they could maybe be dug up in soils and applied in huge quantities as opposed to organic fertilizers like maneuver or uh, other things like that. So these chemical fertilizers were very important for industrial scale farming and slowly over time because you're taking out magnesium in the crops but not putting it back in, what's going to happen is that over time the amount of magnesium in the crops that we eat, so the foods that we eat, like vegetables and um, you know cabbage and all that sort of thing, is going to go down. The uh, second big reason that we see uh, declining magnesium is the refined foods. So when you refine foods, you often take out not only just the fiber, but a lot of the minerals come out as well. So when you process wheat to flour, there's an estimated 82% loss of magnesium. When you go from rice to polished rice, you lose 83%. And from corn to corn starch, it's about 97% of the magnesium is lost. The third big reason is the softening of water. So this is estimated to contribute about 10% of our recommended daily allowance of magnesium. And one of the things that happens is that in the water supply, you actually get calcium and magnesium. If you, if you ever have well water, you may notice this and uh, there's a lot of minerals and they tend to cause a lot of problems with the pipes because they cause this scale, which can block the pipe and you have to scrape it and so on. So a lot of municipal water supplies, for example, are going to soften that water. So it's not gonna cause so many problems with the pipes, but the problem is you're going to lose a lot of that magnesium that we used to get. Number four is alcohol and, uh, and soft drinks. Uh, soft drinks contain a lot of phosphoric acid and the alcohol may increase the urinary excretion of magnesium. Number five uh, might be medical conditions that contribute on certain medications. So in people with uh, gastrointestinal disease, such as inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, 
ulcerative colitis, they may not absorb. Celiac disease, you may not absorb properly. And also, if you're taking certain medications such as diuretics or the so-called water pills, then they may also increase the loss of urinary magnesium. So the, 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 the point of magnesium supplementation is that there are some very interesting studies that have looked at whether supplementing magnesium can make a difference. In 2016, this randomized control trial looked at magnesium on the pressure wave velocity, which is measuring the stiffness of your arteries. Remember, this is a process called arteriosclerosis or the so-called hardening of the arteries. And uh, after 24 weeks, there was in fact a difference um, that you could actually have an improvement in arteriosclerosis leading to a change in the pressure wave velocity. And even though it's a small study and a short duration, um, if you extrapolate those results, the author suggests that it could uh, translate into real decreases in cardiovascular disease up to 7%. The um, meta-analysis of randomized control trials in here showed that supplements could uh, decrease inflammation such as measured with C-reactive protein or CRP and also nitric oxide. Nitric oxide uh, being the gas that tends to relax the blood vessels, again uh, magnesium sort of being that relaxing uh, mineral. The best sources dietary wise in terms of magnesium would be dark chocolate, nuts, legumes, and tofu, so those are the, the plants, and then seafood uh, as well. So the question is, if you're not getting the magnesium in your diet, then how are you going to supplement it? There's two ways that you can supplement it. The first is through the skin, and this is so-called transdermal. And um, for example, if you soak, in a hot spring with mineral water, for example, is a very traditional way of getting that. The problem with transdermal absorption is that there's no good studies to say how much is actually absorbed because the skin is actually designed to repel things from going into our body. That's its sole purpose. But the magnesium may actually get into the body through the hair follicles. So there are some studies, in fact, that suggest that you can absorb it, but the amounts are quite uh, difficult to quantitate, and they may vary quite a bit in terms of how much uh, magnesium there is, you know, your type of skin, how much hair follicles you have. So it, it is a little bit variable, but it can be a source that you can use. And one way is to soak in hot springs. The other is to use Epsom salts, which are magnesium salts. You put them in your bath and you soak for half an hour, for example. The more well-studied way to get magnesium supplementation is through oral supplements. And there's two general types of oral supplements. There's the inorganic type and the organic type. So the inorganic type is basically uh, magnesium oxide. And this is the cheapest form because it's inorganic. You can make it very cheaply uh, in any chemical uh, form. And the you get a lot of elemental magnesium. The problem is because it comes in a form that is not easily uh, absorbed, what happens is that there's a lot of elemental magnesium, but a lot of it goes right through you into the stools and uh, doesn't get absorbed into the body. Magnesium um, does get hydrated, as this shows, by water, but it forms this very sort of unusual double layer of water, which makes the magnesium ion actually quite large and it's hard to get in to get absorbed. So that's why you have to try and maximize the absorption. A lot of laxatives, for example, are going to take advantage of this fact because magnesium hydroxide, um, because it doesn't get absorbed, tends to pull water through you and then therefore cause you to have more excretion of stool. So it's a very common laxative. Um, milk of magnesia, for example, is a very uh, old uh, fashioned uh, laxative and uses magnesium in that way. So inorganic magnesium, magnesium oxide, look for it on the label because if it's there, you get a lot of elemental magnesium, but probably not a lot of absorption of actual magnesium into the body. If you look at the amount of absorption 
of magnesium oxide, this study actually looked at how much uh, magnesium gets into the body. And you can see the very low ones, they're all magnesium oxide. The body simply can't absorb it. And uh, if you look at all the better ones, they're actually organic types of magnesium. So these uh, organic magnesium salts, which um, are typically a little bit more expensive, and they may not contain as much magnesium elemental, but it gets absorbed better, up to 10 times as much magnesium gets into the body. And this translates directly into higher levels of magnesium in the blood. So look for things such as magnesium citrate, magnesium carbonate, magnesium glycinate, or biglycinate. If you're getting any of these symptoms, or you're worried about long-term sort of heart disease, high blood pressure, that thing, that's another reason that you might consider magnesium supplementation, recognizing the fact that our diets compared to 50, 80 years ago are much uh, more depleted in magnesium and therefore supplementation might be a good idea.